Welcome to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. I am John Gulliver, and I will introduce the seminar series and our speaker. This series of seminars is co-sponsored by the Water Resources Center and the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, both at the University of Minnesota. Our speaker today is Dr. Nina Basak, who has been a professor and program leader of the Urban Horticultural Institute at Cornell University for the past 40 years. Nina is on the board of directors of the New York State Urban Forestry Council and is co-author of Trees in the Urban Landscape, a text for landscape architects and horticultural practitioners sabling trees in disturbed and urban landscapes. In addition, she has authored many papers on the physiological problems of plants growing in urban environments, including improved plant selections for difficult sites, soil modification, which includes the Cornell University structural soil, and improved transplanting technology. Nina works closely with municipalities to help implement best practices in urban forestry management, giving on average 10 invited talks per year. Nina received a BS in horticulture from Cornell University and a PhD in horticulture from the University of London. She has received many awards and honors, including the 2015 Alex L. Shigo Award for Excellence in Arboricultural Education from the International Society of Ar Arboriculture. Today, she'll be talking about soils, bioswells, and plants. So it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nina Basuk. Thank you, John. Everybody hear me? Start my video, is that possible? Can I put this yes, we can hear you, Nina. Sounds yeah. great. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen. We can't see your video yet, though. Yeah, I'm trying to do that, but it's not letting me open. Start my video. How about that? We can okay. see you now. Hey, there we are. Okay. Oh, hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be uh, in Central Time here, um, where you all, most of you are, many of you are all over the place, so I've heard. And uh, today I'm going to speak about some work that I've done in the issue of stormwater management. Um, I'm going to highlight three strategies. Um, as you can see on my title slide, um, bioswales, which you're probably all familiar with, and particularly the use of um, uh, blended our specified soil and certain plants for that. I'm going to talk about the scoop and dump uh, technology that we've developed. And, um, and then also a little bit about CU soil and how that's been used for stormwater uh, runoff uh, capture, as well as growing trees. So I'll try to get through all these three things and have plenty of time for questions. <clears throat> okay. Let's go down here. So uh, I've been working in the, with plants and soils in the urban environment for 40 years, as John said. Um, and it's been clear to me that more and more, at least in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, folks have been more and more interested in the ecosystem services we can provide, get from urban uh, trees and soils. And these you can see below, uh, stormwater reduction, air and quality, air and water quality improvement, energy, con energy conservation, carbon sequestration, all these great things, urban heat island mitigation, habitat for pollinators, animals, and there are more. And so we expect our landscapes to do work for us uh, if we choose them correctly, both in the soil and the plant area. And of course, uh, traditional development uh, and more and more is uh, creating large, um, uh, impacts downstream on a regional watershed scale when you see flooding, as we do very often. Uh, here's a highway not too far from me uh, underwater, and I'm sure you've experienced this more and more. So we have to deal with uh, stormwater and uh, watershed issues as we go along. Um, so it's estimated that uh, the U.S. has had about 43,000 square miles of impervious surface and about 400 square miles being added every year. So that's a lot. And so there's more and more need to deal with this runoff from those uh, impervious surfaces. And as we know, bioswales are a useful tool. They slow, direct, clean, and help infiltrate runoff. 
and plants assist with that uh, and creating such um, you know, great ecosystem services as we saw. But plants have a role in this more than just the aggregates and soils that we use to grow plants. So um, as you can see, you have precipitation, you have runoff, and you have the ground. Uh, it could be a turf area, could be impervious. And where the plants fall into this is that they actually can intercept a considerable amount of uh, precipitation. And if, if you think about it, when you're in a light rainstorm, if you want to get out of the rain, you go under a tree. If you're in a heavy rainstorm, that's not the same thing. But plants do uh, intercept quite a bit of rainfall. There's also something called stem flow, which I actually channel water into the ground. Uh, they, of course, evaporate and then transpirate water from the leaves using that water. And then the ground, when it's uh, pervious, can help uh, infiltrate water there. There's also another part, which people don't think about, roots uh, actually are, act as channels for water into the ground, kind of a um, sort of like wormholes. And they actually can uh, preferentially have preferential flow of water into the ground where you have roots. So, and why use plants? They provide infiltration channels, as I mentioned, with roots, take up pollutants, hold soils together, of course, erosion being a big issue, slow runoff and reduce suspended solids, add aesthetic value, and nothing wrong with that, improve air quality and reduce the urban heat island and sequester carbon, increasing biodiversity. All these things are what plants give us um, in these. Uh, off uh, areas. And you've heard about rain gardens. Rain gardens are often thought about as this homeowner uh, or small areas. And here you can see uh, basically water would uh, be channeled into this lower area. And very often I see in many places in the United States, a lot of use of herbaceous plants in, you know, get the big bang for your buck right away with lots of herbaceous plants in color. Uh, in these bioswales or uh, rain gardens. But I, I need to think about, and I need to think about, the, how, you know, we have a lot of winter. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of winter too. But, you know, in the winter, these things can be pretty dire uh, and have no structure after the growing season ends. And so you have a lot of time, many months where there's really nothing ha happening. So we have been using shrubs primarily in these bioswales to provide seasonal interest all during the year. Uh, again, herbaceous plants require pruning to remove dead foliage and look they just look bad in the winter. Or woody plants require less pruning, reducing the overall amount of maintenance. And you, we need to use plants that tolerate wet and dry soils. It's not always raining. We can have periods uh, where we have weeks and weeks of no rainfall. And so these plants need to be able to tolerate both wet, intermittently wet and dry soil. This is a bioswale on Cornell campus with shrubs during the winter. You know, it's winter, so you're not gonna see lots of beautiful leaves, but it does give you structure and a kind of path down that sidewalk. And so I'm just gonna highlight a little case study here we've gone going. This was uh, one of the areas which Cornell decided to take the nose and parking away put an eight foot sidewalk and a uh, verge between the curb and the sidewalk, a five foot uh, area, which we decided to, we asked them to do use a bioswale. It was a quarter mile long. And we started to uh, do this kind of uh, design on it. Basically it was only five foot wide. The curb, we have a drop curb, allowing water to get into this bioswale. We had a designed soil uh, about 18 inches deep and then separated by a geotech and then a open graded stone base to give us a reservoir for catching this water. And the aggregate uh, was important, uh, open graded clean, about one to two inch size stone. And we got about 35 to 40% porosity for a reservoir and that can, you can vary that to met in terms of how much water you want to hold before it eventually goes into the subgrade. 
So this is that bioswale. Now Cornell is all about belts and suspenders. Uh, we didn't really you know, say that they needed to put a perf pipe in there, but well, we were dealing with an institution that uh, wanted to do that. So we have our graded gravel and then a perf pipe at the bottom in case water could get up to the surface and then they would carry it to a storm drain. Uh, and here is our, uh, the geotech between the, the soil and the aggregate. We use a soil which is a very specific graded soil, about 70 to 75 medium to coarse sand, uh, 25 to 20, 20-25% loam, and, uh, and about 5 to 8% organic matter. So um, very specific type of sand of soil that could be infiltrate rapidly, but also support plant growth. And there I am with my class, nothing like having 40 students to do the work uh, and they like to do it. You can see the drop curve there at the bottom where water is coming from that graded uh, crowned uh, road into the bioswales. And it has many of these along the, the whole area, but it's a very narrow bioswale. So it's very challenging from the point of view of dealing with uh, salt, wet and dry and salt, as you'll see. So we planted it in the, in the fall of 2014. It's still there now, it's doing very well. But we had all these different shrubs that we put in, in five replicates of different combinations of shrubs to see which ones would do well under very challenging conditions. We had salt and uh, wet dry, as I've mentioned. So there we are planting in September of 2014. And there it is finished. It's, it's again, it's the fall, so things are not quite so vibrant as they would be in the spring, but they're planted and in groups of different types of plants. And of course we have winter uh, and I said, okay, a little snow, that's fine. A little insulation, um, good for those plants, but you know, it gets worse than that. And here they are, oh, here's the whole bioswale under salty, snowy, dirty uh, area that uh, I said, well, are these plants going to come up? Um, I had some of my doubts, uh, but, uh, and we did some work in terms of salt. Now on the, on the uh, uh, y-axis, you see basically salt concentration in millimoles or decisiemens. And we don't want for plant growth, we don't want anything more than 1.5 uh, decisiemens. And you can see there were times when during the times after a snow or during snow, we had very high salt concentrations in the bioswale. But basically by May, we are down to below one, which is what we want to be. And so the action of stormwater melt and uh, spring rains is important to leach that salt through the growing area into the aggregate below and really basically not affect plant roots. Now that's not to say that salt doesn't affect plant tops. We did have some damage to plant uh, stems, which we had to cut out in our annual maintenance. But there they are, that's uh, spring of 2015, and they all came back. Uh, we did a little pruning to take up any stragglers, any damaged plant uh, stems, but they came back and they were doing very well over that year. And then here he has 2018, they're really going well in that particular soil. All we do in terms of the maintenance of this narrow bioswale is um, we cut back the plants in the spring to basically, you know, maybe 12 inches or so, getting rid of any of the uh, damaged stems, and we mulch it. Uh, we put mulch, uh, shredded bark mulch on the whole area, and that's it. And then we don't water it, we don't fertilize it, we and there have been a few plants of our choice that didn't do as well, and we've removed those and replaced with others, but we've had some good success with several plants. So here, I'm, you know, I'm, perhaps you're not the horticultural audience uh, that you're interested in, but it might be interesting to note what are the, some of the plants we chose to use. And these plants, they're both uh, North American natives and uh, 
from elsewhere, and they all grow in areas that mimic kind of the, the bioswale issue. They have they are coastal, sandy, inundated, salty areas. So we're kind of looking at plants from areas that mimic what we might see in a, in a bioswale, and some of them uh, have done exceptionally well. Uh, so I'll show you some of those. So we're looking at mimics for the urban environment in natural areas. Uh, Morella pennsylvanica, you might know this as myrica or bayberry. This is a really pretty common shrub and it's, it's a coastal shrub primarily, but grows elsewhere. And it did very well on the site. Uh, Rus copalina or shining sumac. This is a, typically a coastal sandy a shrub that we see in the Northeast, creeping willow, a, a low growing willow from Europe. Here's a Bruce Copalina in the natural area in the fall color, uh, just a great plant for uh, tough sites. Hippophae, Rhamnoides or Sprite, this is C. buckthorn. And this is again, a native of uh, uh, Europe. But we, are, we chose a male, because this is dioecious, so it's male and female plants. So we chose a male without any fruit, and a dwarf one. And this actually loves, you can actually water this with salt water and it's perfectly happy. That's Sprite again. One of our unusual plants that we see coastal in uh, all the way from Maine to Florida is uh, uh, Bacris helimifolia or Eastern ground cell. And this blooms very, very late. This is a seashore plant, sandy, marshy, pretty awful soils. You see the right, the yellow flowers on the right are the male flowers and the whites are the pistillate of female flowers. This blooms in late September, early October. So it gives you some color when there's very little in the landscape to offer that. Uh, this is what it looks like in a sort of native habitat and the white flowers in October, uh, just a really, un, you know, nobody really uses this as a nursery plant, but we thought it works really well uh, in the landscape for these kinds of situations. And it's a zone four plant, so it would be perfectly well in, in the colder areas. Another plant that we really like a lot is Cephalanthus, Oxyphantalis, or buttonbush. And this is an obligate wetland plant, but, uh, much to our interest, it does pretty well in dry soil as well. I mean, you won't find it growing in dry in the native landscape, but it, uh, it tolerates wet so uh, dry soil as well. And we've had it here for uh, since the beginning with no death of cephalanthus. We used a smaller variety called Sugar Shack, which has the red buttons, um, just because we don't want as much biomass as the straight species can give us. So what do we've learned from this? Uh, best season to plant, spring, not autumn. I mean, we planted in, in autumn, uh, but it really didn't give plants time to establish uh, before winter. So we always try to opt for planting in spring. So the plants have a, a growing season to get their feet in the ground, so to speak. And we plant for canopy closure. Now, canopy closure is where the canopy of the plants or the leaves of the plants touch each other in the amount one or two years. So we have very, very little weed pressure when uh, foliage covers the soil and reduces light penetration. We do have weed pressure when we have edges. So with a five foot uh, wide bioswale, we do have weed pressure on those edges, but we have canopy closure and that really reduces weed pressure and maintenance. And we want to control height and cut back, uh, removing salt damaged stems, as I mentioned. That's all about that bioswale. So moving along into the scoop and dump uh, technology that we've been developing. Here you see a, a bowl, a uh, depressed area next to a parking lot. And there are three connected bowls uh, in this area. And very often they, these were created when the parking lot was, was built to capture the runoff. And it was just turf uh, bowls and they were pretty boring looking. And, it can't really see from this, but they're really quite deep and nobody liked to mow them. Uh, they were always a pain. So 
grounds at Cornell were delighted and we wanted to actually plant them so they didn't have to mow these things. And to, to do this, this is a really compacted area with a sand lens at the bottom. So water would come over the, the bank and just sheet drain into this sand lens where it would infiltrate. Well, we decided to make the whole thing as an infiltration basin. And we use our traditional uh, t uh, technology called scoop and dump. So very often we have these kinds of soils. This is basically a technology dealing with compaction. And we always have compaction based on, you know, whether it's a building that's been re renovated at Cornell or anywhere in the landscape, you see uh, utility work and soil gets trashed in the process. We get, we see things like blue gray soil. I'm sure many of you have seen this, clods, no structure, a little bit of rusty uh, color. So basically when you have blue gray soil, you have no oxygen. And that's you know, an indication of no drainage or poor drainage. And we would measure our you know, simple field measurement, a penetrometer to look at what the PSI we need to press down to actually get a rooting depth. There's a correlation between PSI, anything over 200 PSI, roots really do not like to grow in that dense soil. We look like to look for anything between 100 or zero and 100 uh, or zero and 200 PSI. Anything above that, we know we have too dense soil for plants to grow in. So scoop and dump, it's very simple. We've been doing this now for 20 years on the Cornell campus. We apply a layer of six to eight inches of compost, which we specify the compost, on a top of a compacted soil. We use a backhoe bucket to dig down to 18 inches width on top of the compost. So we're digging down to 18 inches, lifting the bucket up with a topsoil compost mix, three feet in the air, and then dumping it on the ground and just generally smooth. We don't rototill or anything like that. We plant plants directly into the soil and mulch the surface every year uh, to replenish organic matter uh, and until we get canopy closure. So this is, you see, one of our scoop and dump methods. Uh, we're going down about 18 to 24 inches sometimes because we'll be planting trees, shrubs, all kinds of plants. And we've done this again for many, many years. So uh, I was lucky to have a, a grad student who wanted to actually look at the history of this scoop and dump and what has happened over time. Because we see the plants growing well, but we really didn't take a detailed look on the soil and what was happening to the soil after many years. So. We use the soil health test from Cornell, which measures the physical, biological, and chemical properties of the soil. And we, this was kind of a, just an uh, example of a rating sheet we would get. We see chemical, biological, and physical on the left-hand side, the different tests we would do. Uh, and then the rating with stoplight colors, green being good, red being bad, yellow being moderate. And so we get an indication of the health of the soil over time of these different scoop and dump. And if, just to mention the people who do soil tests for plants that they may just say, I want, I want a soil test, which in most of the case, they want a chemical soil test. And if you look at the chemical part down at the bottom, the green, mostly minor elements and some of the major elements, it basically it says, oh, this is a great soil. It's got lots of elements, lots of nutrients, but they're not considering the biological and physical aspects, which are as important, if not more important, than the, than the chemical aspects. So we like to use this test. It tells us a lot more about soil health than just the nutrients. So this was one of our projects. We, this was a construction, reconstruction of a library to your left. And uh, for three years, there was a building site on the agriculture quad at Cornell. And when all the trailers and trucks and materials got taken out, the place looked like a, well, the place looked like a parking lot and um, campus said, well, why don't you just make a garden in front of the, the, uh, the library? And I said, great, let's do that. So we used our scoop and dump technique and uh, chose appropriate plants. This was the first year after, first growing season after planting and the second growing season and uh, what it looks like now. So plants have grown really well. You see you have canopy closure of the shrubs and some of the trees. And we mulch for three years, uh, beginning of the spring. 
uh, but we don't mulch anymore. We could, but uh, it's not necessary because there are lots of leaves uh, falling to the ground, creating their own mulch, and we don't take the leaves out of the beds. We leave the leaves in there. They are valuable organic matter, which we like to uh, maintain. Just quickly, the, uh, uh, some of the results we found from that research, basically we thought, my hypothesis that you see on the years from zero to 12 years on the x-axis and uh, the bulk density on the y-axis. And so I thought that the first year we actually scooped and dumped, we would have the best bulk density. I mean, we just, we just did it, you know, we just moved all the soil and broke up all those clods and so on. But much to my interest that over time, we actually get better or less or less dense bulk density as we did uh, than we did right at the beginning. And that was extraordinary. And so, um, in fact, we could take a penetrometer and just go right to the hilt on some of these soils. And one of the reasons I think that this is really happening is because we're creating structure with this influx or this shot of microbiology, microorganisms with the compost that is creating structure over time, and we're actually getting less dense soils, which is pretty extraordinary. Again, you see dense, this is just a, a this was a, just a, a field operation here. You can see the dense soil of plowing and then the no-till on the right where you have less density when you don't plow the soil. So these were tests we use for agriculture, but we use them now in the urban environment. Another thing we found of our study was that we're actually increasing the active carbon. Now, active carbon is that portion of organic matter, which is the food for microorganisms. And again, by creating structure in the microorganisms, breaking down the coarser organic matter, we're getting greater active carbon, which increases the amount of microorganisms, which are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of creating structure and uh, breaking down uh, neutral, organic matter to release nutrients. So these microorganisms, we're feeding them and creating more active carbon, which is increasing their populations as well. Okay, that's number two. And number three is uh, a, another project, another technique we've developed here called CU structural soil. And this is a the idea about, I'll tell you what that is and how we used it under pavement to capture storm water. This is an area we were just going to work on. This is part of a pull for trailhead near a inlet at Cornell and Ithaca and the city wanted to produce a, a better parking lot here for people who came. So what is structural soil? So this is a conceptual drawing. You can see the white angular pieces are crushed gravel. So at least two faces crushed, uh, gravel, and about one inch diameter, range from three quarters of an inch to one and a half inch is acceptable. No fines, nothing bigger. So very narrowly graded gravel, which we call number two. It might be called something else where you are. And we use this gravel. If you can think about putting gravel in a bucket and jumping up and down on it, the gravel will, uh, touch other gravel and it will basically become a rigid lattice. You can't compress it, you know, gravel is, can't be compressed. And so when you have that lattice or matrix of gravel, you have lots of pore space if it's one size of a certain size. And within those pores, we add soil and there's oxygen. And uh, basically once you can compact it, so you can actually land an airplane on this thing, but the soil between the stones is not compacted because the compactive load is being borne from stone to stone to stone. This is a point where I like to say, do you understand this? <laughs> I hope you understand it. It's basically a simple system of a rigid lattice or matrix stone bearing the compactive load and in the pores which we created because we are using a very narrowly graded stone, we have enough soil that we can allow roots to grow through that in non-compacted soil. Okay, so this is what it might look like uh, under sidewalk. And the point of this is, and under pavement, you have to have load bearing so that you can have, you're not gonna have subsidence or cracking of the pavement. Yet we still want to have roots to grow through this area. We know we need a lot of volume to have 
plants uh, perform their what we envision them to grow to. And so there are oh, maybe 2,500 installations of structural soil now all over the country. There's a different type of the same principle in Europe and in Asia. So this is our structural soil. Um, well, we, we were growing plants in this and there's, you know, there's some things to know about how, which plants to choose and how to do it. But we also noticed that when we compacted the our CU structural soil to 100% and 95 to 100% proctor density, we get about 26% uh, pore space. And soil alone, we get about 34% pore space and you know, lots more pores when you don't have rock. But then when we looked at the macro pores uh, in the CU soil also compacted to 95% proctor, we're getting about 31% macro pores within that pore space and in soil alone about two percent macro pores so macro pores are what we need for drainage we need for root growth uh, macro pores are wonderful and then we looked at infiltration rate with those large macro pores again after compacting to full proctor density we get infiltration about 24 inches or more per hour in sea soil and less than a half inch per hour in the soil alone. So with this information, we thought, well, we really can use this under pavement, grow trees in it. And especially if we have permeable pavement, we may be able to have a really win-win uh, situation. So here we are back at the parking lot, which we decided to uh, take off the uh, stone there. We dug down to 24 inches and put our structural soil and compacted it in lifts or layers, that six to eight inch layer, uh, about three times we compacted that. And then we put uh, both the porous and a non-porous uh, asphalt on top of that. You can see them in the rainstorm, the, non, the porous asphalt looks, you know, doesn't look shiny where the traditional asphalt is wet. Uh, you can see the difference in porous to the right versus non-porous asphalt to the left. And again, my students, so we saw cut into the asphalt and we planted, uh, actually happened to be bare root trees directly in the structural soil. We wouldn't do this now. This was 2005, this picture. We wouldn't do this now. Uh, we would actually put soil in the saw cut area. The part that doesn't need to be compacted shouldn't have structural soil in it. It should have some normal soil, which can maximize the water holding capacity. Structural soil is only meant to be under pavement where it needs to be compacted for load bearing. So that's the first season, 2006, where they were, uh, these are elm trees that were planted uh, in the asphalt, in the porous and the non-porous asphalt. You notice those yellow barriers. These were one and a half inch caliper trees. And you can imagine the snow plows would do to them when they come to take the snow off. So I wanted them to be seen. A uh, few years later, they're really growing well, um, both in the porous and the non-porous asphalt. Uh, but as we, um, we started to see about 2016, uh, the, the trees in the non-porous asphalt were starting to be smaller. They were small, they were still growing. They were still okay, but they were smaller than the trees in the porous asphalt. So we wanted to look at this. So my friend, Gary Raffel has a ground penetrating radar uh, apparatus, a souped up tricycle, as you see here. And we were wanting to look at where the, what the root growth was like under the porous and non-porous asphalt. And so he took many slices, uh, lines of, radar down to 30 inches uh, with his uh, machine and we would look at that. So this is what we looked at. You can see tree three and four and those in the middle and then six slices to the left and six slices to the right are the, the uh, lines of ground penetrating radar. And what this is looking at root density or, and we're looking at the non-porous lot, the traditional asphalt. And it's a color-coded, uh, um, test where basically the cool of the colors of blue and the green are less roots and the orange and brown are more roots. And these are roots pancaked up to the surface. So we're not looking at depth here. We can do that in another. 
way of doing that, but this is all the root density we have under those lines. And you can see there's, you know, there's some roots there. Um, we have some, you know, few roots in other areas, but this is again, the non-porous asphalt. I wanna show you the porous asphalt. That's the root density in the porous asphalt. And interestingly that we get lots more roots at the surface, which you'd imagine because we get a little bit of rainfall, we get those, that water there. But we also get a lot more roots down at the furthest depth of structural soil, which is about 24 inches. So in, all in all, we're getting about 100% uh, uh, about more roots in the, under the porous asphalt than we did under the non-porous asphalt. And that's giving us an indication when you get trees get more water, they're going to grow bigger. And we actually have, uh, have lots of data and papers on this showing that the root, the root growth and the, tr and the tree growth is correlated in terms of its uh, amount of shoot growth with root growth. So I think I got my 35 minutes, 36 minutes, according to me, um, of my talk. And this is my website, which I really um, hope that you can go to and see lots of uh, information. There's a lot of different uh, bulletins, videos, all kinds of things that uh, on all these different topics, which I hope that you will uh, use. So that's it. So hopefully we have some questions. Uh, thank you, Nina. We have a lot of questions. Um, and, and there, uh, there are quite a few people who are responding to them. Um, here's one that I think is interesting for everybody. I have a recently had a lot of pushback by city engineers in terms of no rain gardens or water near a road due to concerns with water into the road base. How do you respond to that? Has that been a limitation? And do you put a moisture barrier between the trench and the road? We don't do that. That's not been a concern by any of the engineers that I've spoken to. Uh, to get Again, I mean, even in that narrow bioswale, which was right next to the road, we haven't had any problem with uh, moisture getting into the road or causing any kind of frost heaving. But that's not an experience I've had. That's good. That's great. <laughs> Here's another question from Luke M. Are there concerns that the geotextile fabric separating the engineering soil and the subways will become clogged with time and result in water logging, water logging of the upper layer? Uh, we've never seen that. Again, the, the uh, soil is very well drained, uh, very high infiltration. Um, you know, this, the geotech uh, basically was to prevent the soil from going into the open graded gravel below. Uh, we have not seen anything getting more waterlogged. Again, there's that perf pipe, maybe Cornell knew something um, that takes any kind of excess water uh, uh, away. And so uh, we have not seen you know, a, a clogging of the geotech and excess water getting on the top part of that uh, profile. Thank you for that. Uh, here's a... <clears throat> A question from an, an anonymous attendee. Here in Minnesota, we have found that rain gardens with soil have that's been amended with compost can be a source of phosphorus and discharged water instead of a phosphorus sink. Is this a concern in your installations? Yeah, we so after we developed the scoop and dump method and we were using it, and then we'd always talk about it, and then someone would ask, just like now, well, what about the compost? What's the best compost? You don't want to have leaching of phosphorus or nitrogen and cause eutrophication or you know, pollution in nearby waterways. And so we developed another student who developed the compost spec for uh, allowable P and N in the compost so that it wouldn't become a uh, you know, problem with leaching. So again, not all compost is equal. I mean, you can, especially manure-based compost, they can really put a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen into the water. But we use a compost that, again, you can make it over many different feedstocks, you know, green waste, food waste, manure, but um, it has to be tested. And we have a spec for that, which I'd be happy to share uh, at some point. <clears throat> Thank you. A follow on to that question would be uh, peat instead of compost. Uh, and we have a, a research project at the University, University of Minnesota that Andy Erickson is running where a peat is used instead of compost. 
and the plants do not grow as much in peat as they do in compost. And I was wondering if you had any experience with that. Yeah, we won't, we won't use peat. Peat has nothing in it. Peat's a structural uh, water holding and aeration, but it has no nutritional value. Also, it's non-sustainable, at least for us. We don't use it anymore. And we like to use sustainable, you know, food waste than compost. Uh, so we would never use peat. It doesn't have any nutritional value. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so here's a question uh, specific to Minnesota. Uh, we have a long uh, light rail line here in the Twin Cities uh, with the longest tree trench for stormwater management installations in the world, several miles. It was built several years ago. Most of the trees are planted in CU structural soil. You might be familiar yeah, with it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the green line. Some of the trees are doing well, but many of the trees have not thrived. What is the best protocol for evaluating the health of these trees and learning why they succeeded or failed? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there are ways to do any technology right or to do, I mean, for instance, I give an example of someone who said to me, oh, I use your CU soil, I, I put it in a tree pit. I said, well, take it out. I mean, it's meant to be under pavement. So with the green line, I, I heard about it I, uh, a long time ago. There are, there are issues in terms of what trees to plant. First of all, you have to have enough volume of CO soil because it has the lower water holding capacity. It's about 8% available water. And so you have to have enough volume or to have it uh, uh, linking between a, a soil which has more water holding capacity to enable, enable the trees to do well. It also, depending on the stone type, for instance, on uh, West, Western New York, where I am, um, we are cheap, stone is limestone. So um, that has implications in terms of pH. And we just choose plants that tolerate a pH of 7.8 to 8, which is normal for us. We don't worry about it. There are plenty of plants that tolerate that pH. But if you're choosing a plant that like red maple or uh, which plants that don't tolerate high pH, uh, they won't do as well. So the pH, the water holding capacity, and the volume are keys to a successful planting. And again, if you don't have, if there's an opening where the tree is, where you don't have to have CU soil, you can uh, just plant it in normal soil and then only CU soil under the pavement. That's the more, uh, a better option because you have more water holding capacity. I am working on a project right now and trying to up the water holding capacity of CU soil by using biochar, but that's still in the works and I'm not ready to publish that yet. Okay. All right. Good. Great. So here's a question from Mike Trojan. For the first two projects you discussed, did you observe changes in infiltration rates as vegetation became established? No, uh, we would, you know, the soil that we chose for that, um, uh, the bioswale, the, the quarter mile long bioswale was, you know, 75% sand of medium to coarse size. So it was very well drained and we never see standing water or, or any kind of, I actually haven't tested the infiltration rate, but I noticed just visually walking by it every day that we never get any standing water there. Uh, in terms of the scoop and dump, we use that on many different sites, maybe 20 different sites on the Cornell campus, and they're all different soils. Uh, we tend to put more compost where it's a clay soil. And if we have a more loamy or sandy soil, we'll put maybe a third compost, maybe 50% compost volume for volume in a clay soil. Um, we've noticed that I go around and check with a penetrometer to see whether we're getting any kind of increase in density. But as you saw from the bio, uh, the bulk density, we're getting actually better bulk density over time in these scooped and dumped soils. So I'm, the infiltration is, is great. And that's part of the, it wasn't necessarily the reason we did this scoop and dump it was to re reduce compaction and allow plants to grow. But the uh, silver lining is we're getting great infiltration here as well. Thank you. So the next uh, question comes uh, again from Brett Emmons. Under porous or, or impervious asphalt, they're talking about clogging uh, and more and deeper roots under the porous pavement. Could the difference be due to air exchange and deeper oxygen availability? Maybe. Um, 
First of all, I, you know, in terms of porous asphalt, um, there was always the idea that you had to vacuum clean it um, because you get debris and it clogs it up. The infiltration rate is so fast, greater than 24 inches an hour, that even if we lost 50% of that with clogging of the pores, it would still be really fast. So we're not, you know, there's numerous uh, porous asphalt um, um, uh, construction here on uh, in Ithaca, and not necessarily with, with structural soil, but some with just gravel, and some of them for 20 years, and they have not been vacuumed, and they're doing fine. So again, it's important to have the uh, the reservoir of structural or aggregate underneath it to uh, get that great infiltration. Um, in terms of aeration, I you know we it's not a sealed surface, uh, sealed container. This the, what I showed you in terms of that parking lot. So there's air coming in from other areas. Um, um, I would doubt very much uh, that aeration would be uh, limited in the impervious asphalt. Maybe, um, I've done some work with this long time ago and we were getting deep uh, aeration and structural soil uh, down to, you know, where we weren't getting any kind of depletion uh, down to 24 inches. And I don't think we'd have to get, it'd have to be really sealed before we would lose the aeration e even in porous and non-porous asphalt. So I would, you know, I haven't looked at that specifically, but it's an inter interesting idea. Okay, great. I have a, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, uh, in, uh, I think in most cities, you see a lot of what are called uh, tree coffins. <laughs> Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, first off, how do you avoid having build, building these tree coffins? Uh, and uh, secondly, couldn't you put trees in your five foot wide bioswells instead of bushes? Or is that just basically, uh, un you can't avoid a tree coffin? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, tree coffins. I mean, that was the, really the reason why we developed structural soil was to provide, we did a lot of work in the 90s about how much soil volume do you need to support a tree to its de envisioned design size, and we need a lot. Uh, so where trees are doing well, their roots are basically uh, finding a way out of the tree coffin into somebody's front yard or hitting the sidewalk and going somewhere else. Um, trees do not live for a long time in the tree coffin. So we developed structural soil to put under the sidewalk so that the coffin would just be the opening, it wouldn't be a coffin. And um, we have all that area under the sidewalk as rooting volume. Uh, so, and also there are times when we would use breakout zones. We'd take two flags of concrete off next to a tree, put structural soil in, repave next, to, if there was a green space next to it. So we would safely channel or usher those roots into somebody else's front yard, which worked very well and also not heave the sidewalk. So we've always tried to find different ways of using it. And if you can get roots into a, you know, a soil that's not compacted, they will do much better. Uh, if, if you have nothing else but just you know, sidewalk and no other adjacent green space, um, you just need to use a lot of volume under the sidewalk and choose the right plants that are more drought tolerant uh, to do well. So talking about drought tolerant plants uh, and, and the bushes that you, you were discussing. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. how, about, how about raspberries? I like <laughs> raspberries uh, and they seem to Who be- Who doesn't like raspberries? <laughs> I'm sorry? Who doesn't like raspberries? Yeah, yeah. And so how would they work? Do you think they'd be good or would they, would they not be good? Well, I think they might be good if it was your home landscape, but it would be a disaster for you know, 50 students walking down the street and getting caught in the raspberry canes as they... Uh, uh, uh. I have a, a, a Rosa palustris, which is a swamp rose um, on that bioswale. That's another plant I didn't mention. Um, and I have to keep it pruned uh, pretty well because it's a student highway. And um, if I don't do it, grounds will do it in a less, uh, aesthetic way. So I need to make sure that anything with thorns is not going to be encroaching on where people walk. 
Uh, I mean, raspberries are very tough. I mean, they tolerate a lot of different soils. They would be well, I just don't think uh, practically they'd work in that site. Okay. I, I wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> about <the laughs> we, have a lot of, we have a lot of students here. <laughs> um, the next uh, question is from an anonymous attendee. Using large, long-lived urban trees for stormwater management, it's a long question, seems to be a great idea for waiting for widespread implementation. We have the technologies and planting systems. We know about a broad range of significant benefits. Despite all that, the use of trees for stormwater management has not taken off in a big way. Why is that true? And what should we do about it? Well, it's education. That's, um, uh, for as long as I've been working here, some people say, well, trees are nice, but they don't see all the other benefits for which we plant trees. And all you need to do is look at a place where emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle has come and basically taken all the trees off some of those landscapes. Uh, you can see what effect it has on people. People don't really value trees until they're gone. <coughs> Excuse me. But, but I think we can do better in terms of the technologies we use. I think we can choose better plants that uh, are long lived, more diversity. Uh, it's education and it's demonstration of, uh, and it's using, you know, uh, tools like iTree, which uh, evaluates, gives you a monetary value of tree ec ecosystem benefits. That's the Forest Service model iTree. It's nothing like going to, uh, you know, your local legislature and asking for money for budget for trees. If you can say, well, this is giving you, uh, each tree is giving you 500 $20 over 20 years of benefits and increasing uh, homeowner values and doing all these valuation things. And then the legislatures tend to sit up and say, oh, okay, they're not just costing us, they're actually paying us back. And so uh, it's, a, it's a long process, but I think the more we all talk about this and have our ducks in a row and have our good tree species and, and good planting uh, types, uh, good planting technologies, I think uh, we'll get there. Thank you. So we have a lot of questions. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll, I'll keep asking you questions. <laughs> the next one comes from David Van Huizen, uh, and his question is, what guidance is available on the hydrology of the bioswells? Does the water all eventually infiltrate? Is there a design capture volume before it overflows? Um, well, you know, depending on your, so we have water coming off of the road into the bioswale. So we also have, we know about, you know, 100 year storms, if that's still valid. I mean, uh, in when we have structural soil, which we have maybe, you know, 26% or 30% uh, open pores, we can capture six inch rainfall and hold it there and let it, you know, drain slowly into the subgrade, uh, you know, so the question of how much reservoir you have under the growing area will allow you to capture more water. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. I'm not a hydrologist. I work with people who are hydrologists. I work with engineers. I can sort of talk the talk, but um, I'm just looking at the water holding capacity and the reservoir capacity of uh, these bioswales. Okay, uh, here's a, uh, another question about uh, porous concrete. Um, was there any issue with buckling? And, and I know you're not a porous concrete <laughs> expert, but the, uh, just out of curiosity, was there any issue with buckling or crackling of the surface of the porous asphalt with more root growth close to the surface? So the asphalt or concrete we're talking about? Uh, porous asphalt. asphalt. Asphalt, we, we, the main thing about structural soil is you get roots to grow down deep. And we've had, we have a long-term experiment where we're seeing whether the typical way we plant trees um, with a narrow tree lawn next to you know, a sidewalk, if we can grow the tree, the roots down deep, they won't buckle the sidewalk. It's the, it's the, when you have compaction, the roots, if they're gonna get out of that coffin at all, they go along the area of weakness between the concrete and the base cores. 
And that's where they grow and that we cause them to grow that way because we've compacted the subgrade underneath that. So where roots get out of their narrow areas, they will buckle a sidewalk um, because their radial growth of the structural roots. Where we've grown trees in structural soil next to it, we see roots growing much deeper and none of those big uh, structural roots heaving sidewalks. But I would say also, it's good not to plant or put concrete or asphalt right next to the tree. You have to give it you know, at least a meter or so or more of space, uh, you know, four to six feet if you can, to allow those buttress roots to form. They have to form to enable, enable the tree to be stable. Well, I, I guess, uh, thank you, Nina. Well, I will cut this off now and we will move into the panel discussion in five minutes. For now, I'd like to everyone to raise the hand to uh, clap your hands to thank Nina. I'm going to clap live. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. My name is Andy Erickson and I will moderate the panel discussion as we move into that. You may have noticed a poll pop up. I encourage you to answer that poll if you haven't already. As our panelists begin sharing their videos, it is my pleasure to introduce our local experts as panelists today. Uh, I'm going to start with our first local panel expert, and his name is John Niebuhr. He is a professor in the Department of Biosystems and Bioproducts Engineering at the University of Minnesota. John, from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, and I, I do want to thank uh, Nina for that great presentation and all those questions from the audience have been really been uh, inspiring. Uh, anyway, I've been doing uh, stormwater research for about the last 15 years or so. Uh, most of the work has been done in cooperation with uh, John Gulliver. Um, and I, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that I've been working so much with him on things. Uh, much of the work has been on studying soil infiltration characteristics of uh, potential stormwater control uh, systems. And here we've uh, developed a method for relatively rapidly uh, determining infiltration of stormwater practices. And uh, we're currently working on a project, a GIS-based uh, identification and assessment method to uh, determine potential stormwater control sites that would be really helpful to contractors and planners. And I want to acknowledge the funding by the Department of Trans Minnesota Department of Transportation and Local Roads Research Board in funding most of that research. It's been really great working with them. Uh, we've also done studies on uh, leachate from uh, infiltration practices uh, to be able to determine uh, let's say leachate of heavy metals and uh, chloride, nitrate, uh, phosphorus, and so on to uh, potentially go and contaminate groundwater underneath those sites. Um, and then I do want to mention that I'm involved in a new project that's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's the Urban Long-Term Ecological Research Study, which uh, Twin Cities is the study area. And again, I'll mention that John Gulliver is a co-PI along uh, with me and 23 other uh, researchers. Uh, this, will, as I say, is in Twin Cities, and it's looking at the urban ecosystem. So all the components of that, human infrastructure, plants, trees, lawns, uh, people, animals, pollinators, ponds and lakes, nutrients, thermal climate, and all that. And Nina was speaking about these features in terms of ecosystem services. So I think that um, that's going to be a really interesting project. It's uh, funded for five years. And I think a lot's going to come out of that, and some of it's going to be uh, related to the interconnectedness of all these different things that are involved in these urban environments. So that would include soils, the plants, uh, you know, all the hydro hydrologic aspects, the uh, climate effects, and so on. That's great, John. Thank you so much. Uh, our next panelist is Dave Bauer. He is a senior environmental specialist at Alliant Engineering. So Dave, based on your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Well, I most, uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. I most relate to the bioswales. Um, 
over my career, I've served in more of a regulatory field role and I've gotten to uh, inspect you know, between 500 and 1,000 of these basins as they're being constructed. So 100, over 100 a year with the Rice Creek Watershed District and then about 45 a year with, uh, with uh, Minnesota's Department of Transportation. Um, so I've gotten to see the, the technology improve and the industry improve from, you know, when we first started, about a third of these were successful from a regulatory point of view. And uh, as I was, uh, before I moved to Alliant, we were getting closer to 90% success rate with, uh, you know, based on stormwater disappearing, stormwater management, and if plants were growing. Now I know they're you know, Nina's, I'm guessing that Nina would uh, cringe if she saw some of those regulatory basins because they're planted by seed and uh, a, a nice seed mix. And then we walk away and maybe mow it once every five to 10 years. So most of my basins that I've been a part of are um, uh, range from being small to uh, being the size of small athletic fields um, along freeways and such. So there's different uh, different goals involved when you're dealing with a regulatory regulatory uh, basin. That's great, Dave. Thanks for that. Our next panelist is Matt Summers, who is a soil scientist at Wank, which is now Stantec, part of Stantec. Matt, from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Uh, it's been tied to my whole professional history. So I was a uh... What the U of M used to call a non-traditional student. I went back to school in my early 30s, graduated from the U of M with an environmental science degree in 2010. Oh. <clears throat> my first uh, job was an internship working under David Bauer at Rice Creek Watershed District. Uh, and at that time in 2010, the assumption was that most infiltration basins are failing. A large part of why it's gotten better is regulatory entities like David and others doing a lot of education with civil engineers who are in charge of designing these stormwater practices. At the time, um, there was a misunderstanding of soil properties. Um, you know, Minnesota is kind of a northern Florida. We're a big flat sponge with very shallow groundwater. So underground storage is a problem. Infiltration is a problem uh, during the wettest parts of our year. Here, you know, and working now at an engineering firm for the last 10 years, I work with a lot of stormwater engineers and they bring me in on some projects when they're more challenging or there's greater concerns or the geotech is misleading. It's frequently the soils investigation for stormwater features is done by geotechnical borings and not uh, soil scientists like Dave or I. But it, it's an active part of my ongoing professional life. That's great, Matt. Uh, I won't ask for Nina's relation to the topic. We had a great seminar by her on that background. so. That sets the stage for our panel discussion. I do want to point everyone's attention to the poll. Uh, hopefully you can see the poll uh, results on your screens, but I'll read this out. Uh, in the meantime, think of questions for our local experts in our panel and post those in the Q&A and I will ask them shortly. But back to the poll question, uh, we asked how many soil science courses have you had? We wanted to get an idea of the soil science background of our audience today. And I can see here that almost 50% of those that responded have only had one or two soil science courses. That actually is the same category I would fall into with my civil engineering degree. I had two soil related courses. One was a soil science geology based course and one was a geotech course. Uh, but I can see that 12% had three to five courses. 6% had more than five courses. And another 6% of our audience here actually have soil science degrees. So hopefully this seminar is hitting that group uh, very well. You should be very familiar with these concepts. But interesting to me is that 28% of our audience that responded to this poll actually have had no soil science courses. So that's really interesting and fascinating. I really appreciate that you're here for this seminar. I hope you're getting things out of this seminar and learning a lot. Um, what I, I learned a lot from, from Nina's presentation, and I hope that we get more from our local experts in the panel discussion. So we actually already have a question in the Q&A from our audience, so I will ask that question from the, uh, to the panel. Uh, anybody can respond in any order here. And the question is, 
Can any of you point to a bioswale design manual? In particular, how to evaluate the hydrology? This, the person, David, that's asking the question says, here in Texas, we need to show the runoff control aspects of the design to get them accepted as stormwater control devices. So what experience do you have in this area? What could you give David and the rest of our audience for uh, resources for this? Uh, uh, I'm, yeah, go, go ahead, John. Sorry, I, yeah, I might mention that uh, Minnesota has, uh, the state has the Minnesota Stormwater uh, Design Manual and the University of Minnesota project. I didn't mention that uh, John and I and others, John led this project where they uh, developed a stormwater control um, BMP assessment manual. And this was back in the late, well, around 2010 or so like that, if I recall correctly. So That's correct. we, do, we do have a stormwater manual and that manual is uh, for the state. And that manual is uh, continually updated. Uh, with new information that's coming, for instance, out of the uh, this uh, the group at uh, St. Anthony Falls. Yeah, that stormwater manual is very nice. Um, if you're looking for more specific, just for uh, urban roads, the Minnesota Department of Transportation's uh, Metro District uh, created a um, guidance document that has both design and construction. Um, parameters very specific to um, to what we're looking for here for here in Minnesota, but includes uh, um, uh, water coming in and also uh, when we switch to uh, filtration versus infiltration and stuff like that. So, is our contact information going to be available, Andy? Yes. Uh, what we will do after the recording, and this is for the benefit for everybody, when the recording is available on YouTube, I will share an email with everybody that registered today. Uh, we can share contact information for all, all of our panelists if they are willing to do that. Well, I'm sure they are. Uh, so you can email any of them for those resources. I will also actually take all of the questions, both for Nina and the panel, and share them with our panel members. They can add links to resources, such as the one Dave mentioned, uh, I actually posted the stormwater manual link in the chat if you're interested in that as well. Uh, but we will share that with all the registrants uh, after the seminar when the recording is available. Any other resources we want to add for that particular question, bioswale design and hydrology? I was going to punt to John in the engineering side anyway. <laughs> That's good. Uh, we have another question in here from the audience. Um, the uh, the Mike Trojan is asking this question and he's saying, being trained in soils, I don't wanna discourage soil discussion, but I liked Nina's focus on vegetation. Uh, how important is it to bring in the plant experts into these discussions and, and how do we do that? How do we connect these cross disciplines when obviously this topic is multidisciplinary? I can answer a little bit that uh, the plant people are there are plant people in most every state that can deal with these issues. Um, and I've seen, I, typically what I've seen mistakes where people think that stormwater uh, bioswales only require plants that are wet time. And that's a mistake because uh, they also, it doesn't rain all the time. And so there are times when they need to tolerate dry conditions as well. So, I mean, we have a, a manual, which I'll hopefully get to you a, URL for that uh, on plants for uh, bioswales. And uh, again, it's its own, it's northern mostly, but um, there are several places where those people exist and the resources exist. And I hope it helped to, to share that with you. Um, for us, it's on our side and the private side, it's a factor of scope and budget largely. Uh, what's the <laughs> the client's desired outcome. I mean, we have a, a vast team of botanists, landscape architects, soil scientists, um, ecologists, hydrogeologists, anybody that needs to be brought to bear depending on the project you wanna design. Typically for a private project, their concern is the regulatory side. Can we get our permit and can we build our facility? If they're not particularly interested in a bigger picture stormwater design, it's not really our place to push them into it necessarily. Uh, typically, our, we're interesting in progressive projects come from 
uh, public clients who are trying to create demonstrations and are in charge of you know, improving local water quality. But projects we've worked on, certainly, if you bring in the landscape architects and the botanists and all the, the environmental services people, that's when you get a complete project. But also, you've added all these teams and added a lot of cost. Absolutely. I've seen some um, with, with uh, Minnesota's Department of Transportation, I've seen some initiative work where their initiative is to um, support monarch butterfly migration or rusty patch bumblebee habitat. That is how um, the Department of Transportation is, is justifying putting more effort into what plants they use. We won't see trees as much in the right of way just because people can't stay on the road <laughs> with their cell phones, but, uh, but hopefully we'll see more shrubs and stuff because uh, what Nina was showing was looking very nice. <laughs> By the way, I just uh, mentioned a little plug for my graduate student who's uh, finishing up. Uh, will be starting an assistant professor position at University of Minnesota on September 1st. And he really knows his plants. <laughs> That's exciting. That's great. It's, uh, it's great to have more and more talent in Minnesota. Any other comments on that question? Well, I, I would just mention that uh, to ask. Uh, whether you should have a vegetation person involved in the, and I think that's what the question was, would be like saying, well, what does, what difference does it make what kind of soil you use? And maybe we should have a soil scientist involved. So, you know, to me, the whole system has to have this expertise, different expertise to make it work. And you can spend all this money putting this in. And then if you don't have the right plants, the system is not going to work. And uh, so then you have to go back and retrofit maybe. And if you don't take into account what kind of plants you're going to put in, maybe the retrofit won't work either. So you spend a lot of money and you could have invested in the first place. So I would say that uh, plant scientists are essential to the whole thing. 100% agree. Yeah, I think that's a great comment. Um, and that actually kind of feeds into and maybe even partially answers the, the next question I wanted to ask. Um, is, is to back up a step and say, you know, what are or what do you think are the most important benefits of having healthy soils and that combination of the appropriate vegetation as part of our stormwater management toolbox? You know, what, what are those major important benefits that we should be going for? Um, realizing that there's multiple benefits. So we can list as many as we, as we can here. But what are we getting out of this for having uh, good choices in our designs? Uh, I'll say two things, uh, one big picture, one smaller picture. I'm kind of a, a soils preacher. So on the bigger scale, right, the soil ecosystem is the foundation of so many of our other ecosystems. You want healthy prairies, healthy forests, healthy lakes, rivers, healthy cities. You need healthy soil. If you want healthy soil for stormwater functions, you need the right biology. As, as Nina alluded to in her talk, and expand a little more, soil structure is what gives you water transport and soil. Soil structure is created and maintained by the biological activity, you know, including roots, which produce macropores, but those are just creating the spaces. How do you hold the structure together? Well, that's created by all the biological exudates, the worm poop and the micro poop and everything else that creates your glomulin and your other compounds that hold your aggregates in place and create stable structure that has some resistance to light compaction. Um, and that all of that to get that takes the right design and time and uh, the quality of the soil that you started with. Other comments on that? I just say that, uh, you know, I, I always heard that, you know, you need 50,000 years to make soil. You can actually make structure in a, just a number of years by adding compost and microorganisms to a structure that you've decompacted. I was surprised at this, but I was the data we have on structural improvement is, is amazing based on adding compost and decompacting the soil. A, a lot of cities also have climate change initiatives. And it's a lot cheaper to uh, increase your soil health and maybe get a little bit more carbon sequestered on a degraded soil than it is to uh, 
upgrade all your HVAC systems and switch your fleet to electric cars. That's a really great point. Uh, of course, the, the plants help with that heat balance as well. So, and on top of all that, there's the cultural or you know, the aesthetic value of all that vegetation. Yeah, absolutely. And it, there's multiple benefits here. Uh, so we have a question from the audience that I want to take. Uh, we can see uh, this actually comes from Kevin. Uh, and Kevin asks, research has indicated that sand with minimal amounts of compost may provide an ideal growing media for most native plants and minimize the amount of phosphorus leaching out of compost. Uh, this question of compost and phosphate release came up during Nina's Q&A. So the question is, uh, what considerations does the panel use in balancing the potential of phosphate leaching out of compost with the benefits of it addressing uh, the benefits it has with addressing other pollutants? And I would add all the other benefits of having good vegetation and uh, soil structure that we get out of the compost in that mix. What comments do you have on that? I, guess, I, don't, I would be a little concerned about just sand and compost. Um, I mean, unless there's some way of getting the organic matter back in the soil, uh, that's going to be depleted pretty rapidly. Uh, and so it could, may be okay for a while, but uh, I would like to see some other particle size analysis there. I mean, a bit more loam, a bit more compost, and, uh, and a way to get the compost back. If you want, you know, in a perennial landscape, you're not, it's not like a field, you can just dig it up and and stuff. You have to be able to find a method to put back the organic matter. And that's that's going to be an, an issue. Uh, my concern would be, you know, sand has less capacity to take up incoming pollutants from the, from the incoming water. You need those silts and clays in that surface area and that CDP <laughs> activity to really, if you want any kind of nutrient mineral exchange, <clears throat> sand is not the best substrate. Yeah, the, the compost leaching, I think, um, and the scientists here can, can uh, expand on this, but I think it hits early in the first couple seasons and then, then the compost is mostly, mostly degraded. I saw a basin, we actually took some measurements. Um, we started with about 20% compost by volume in, in sand and it was an infiltration basin. And when we went to take soil tests a few years later, um, we were down to um, the organic matter by mass was less than uh, 2%. So um, I'm comparing volume to mass. So, you know, it's a little bit apples and oranges there. Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice to, to come up with uh, a better way to include loam in some of these regulatory regulatory mixes. It's just what we saw at, at the Department of Transportation was that it was so variable what we would get and it was hard to control. So I think that's why the, the DOT used a lot of sand compost mixes. Uh, Andy, if I may uh, be uh, ask a question instead of just trying to answer questions uh, related to that last question and that is about retention of nutrients like phosphorus or nit you know, possibly nitrate, uh, nitrogen, um, but maybe heavy metals as well. And uh, I think if I recall correctly, Nina was talking about some new work that they're doing on biochar. Mm -hmm. And I know we've got work going on here in Minnesota on biochar. So is that a possible way to try to provide a longer term uh, absorption capacity for, um, the bioswales or for rain gardens and so on? Um, yes. I know our, I've, Andy had asked us to think up some project examples. We're not going to get into it, but we are the, so the, the newest, latest projects going in that are being sponsored by watershed districts as demonstrations and direct water quality projects are your iron enriched sand filters and then iron enriched sand filters with biochar. The, the, the goal of the iron, the iron is to help uptake phosphorus. And then the biochar, specifically in the metro, we have all these lakes that get shut down in the summer. I mean, Minnesota and lakes, they go hand to hand and these urban lakes get shut down because of E. coli. And the thought is if you add biochar, that helps remediate bacteria 
as well as heavy metal pollutants. Because that's typically been the traditional use of biochar for some environmental projects is for contaminated sites and you know heavy metals. And recently we're adapting it and others for bacterial removal. But so these the projects we've done are still in the early stages. We have one or two years of data, which are optimistic. They're looking good. They're just proving somewhat effective. Uh, ultimately what will prove effective is what whether or not beaches get closed. That's how the truth gets measured out. Go ahead if you have other comments. I know I can say, uh, I can speak to some of the research. Um, we actually have a few different papers specifically on that concept, uh, both talking about other pollutants and capture, but also uh, amendments. So if I talk about pollutants first, uh, we, we have some research that looked at metals captured by compost, looked at uh, actually biodegradation of pHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in rain guardian media because of the, of the compost that was there and the, and the microbiology that was occurring because of the organic matter and the roots and the rhizosphere. So there is some work there and I can share those references and resources uh, related to compost. Uh, we are doing some work right now related to amendments, things like biochar, things like iron to remove phosphate, things like uh, spent lime to remove phosphate. We've also done some previous research looking actually at granulated, granular activated carbon, which is very similar to biochar, although a bit more manufactured. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've shown that, that some uh, GAC, granular activated carbons, can actually remove nitrate from water through adsorption. And it's not based on the biological process of denitrification. So there is some work out there. There's obviously more work needed, uh, but I agree with, with the comments that, that uh, you know, we need to think holistically about these media. We need to think about all of the things that we're trying to do with a single media uh, and, and really tailor that media to, to achieve multiple benefits and get at all of these aspects. Um, it got me thinking, so a good half of my work as a soil scientist is in the on-site wastewater treatment world. So we help design, I help design and size big, big septic systems, you know, facilities and rural schools and things. In a lot of ways, there's a lot of parallels. We're trying to get rid of a contaminated water source while also treating the, the wastewater. Some of the constituents are the same. Some are very different. I think the biggest difference is, you know, the rates of flow and the predictability and the volumes and the rates. But there's a lot of overlap between the disciplines, but in my experience, there's not necessarily a lot of overlap between the professionals and the researchers. Um, there's, there's parallel research being taken under, underway and the, the two worlds, especially in the regulatory side in a place like Minnesota, are very, very different. But the general concepts of what you're trying to do are very similar. Other comments, go ahead, please. I like how Matt summed it up with, uh, with the beaches. Um, beaches staying open. I mean, those are, you know, we have all our parameters for, we're measuring in research, but in the end, there's a threshold that we reach that, um, that the public notices. I also think that's uh, worthwhile having a, really viable compost specification because you can have uh, you know, mature compost that still has, you know, it's gonna be feeding too many of those microorganisms that are, you don't want. Um, and so uh, I'd be happy to share the one we have, which is for lower P and N uh, mm -hmm. leachate. That's what microorganisms don't you want? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I was thinking of, uh, you know, PNN to increase uh, eutrophication. We don't want too much of that. Gotcha. I do want to circle back actually to a, to a comment um, related to a question and a comment that Dave made, uh, incorporating loam, incorporating some of the other materials. Uh, I do know 
historically in Minnesota, that was one of the biggest challenges is we had so many infiltration basins and rain gardens failing uh, immediately after construction, you know, while we had a topsoil component in the mix, while we had even a loamy sand component in the mix. Uh, and it's, there's been a lot of work towards, you know, how do we properly design these? How do we make them effective? Still today, as John Niebuhr mentioned, actually in his intro, uh, we have an ongoing project right now helping to better site where we put infiltration basins. It wasn't necessarily the media that was the fault, but in some cases they were put in a bad place. Shallow groundwater, like, like Matt mentioned, even shallow bedrock or other soils or other issues that affected the hydrology and the geohydrology of these systems, forcing them to fail. So I think, I think it's, it's as, I'm, as I just mentioned before, we have to think very carefully about the media, what are the components we put in, what are the benefits and the purposes, and can we come to something that achieves all the benefits we're trying to and really limits the negatives or the consequences that could happen, reducing failures, minimizing or limiting maintenance as we can, uh, so that we can get systems that we can put in and, and have them work reliably for the future. I'm glad you mentioned that. The Minnesota Stormwater Manual has a few quirks in it. I know this is something Dave and I talked about when I was working with him. Um, when you talk about siting, particularly in the first sort of 10 years of these infiltration basins, you know, the 2000s, even going on, a big problem has been putting them where they shouldn't, particularly when it comes to either compacted subsoils or high groundwater. And the reason that so many of those conditions weren't ever identified because they didn't send the right people to the site to identify them. There was a period where engineers could basically rely on soil survey hydrologic group and assume an infiltration rate. And you could do that. Now the, the, you know, the design guidance now is you, you need some kind of on-site observation, but typically that comes from geotechnical borings. Uh, it's not typical, even at my firm or others, that they send their resident soil scientists to go out and identify soil structure, texture, and depth to groundwater. Um, and to be honest, part of that is because we are always going to find the high seasonal groundwater, and that can be a real pain for your design. You know, in Minnesota, like a septic system, you have to have the three feet of separation from the bottom of your infiltration feature to the top of seasonal groundwater. There's not a lot of places in Minnesota where you're going to get six feet, you know, to dig your, to dig your basin and then have the good soil. You can create amendments and raise that back up if you can get the water there. And people are smart about that now. But still, if you can just rely on geotech, you're going to find yourself able to get more infiltration systems approved and permitted than if you'd sent me or Dave out. And, and the ones that'll be successful, right? Better choices. They may be successful anyway, right? It may only, they only, may only have high groundwater for short periods in the year, but if your high stormwater event happens to coincide, then you're not gonna meet your infiltration rate. And if that's from the regulars, that's the week Dave came out to inspect it, you're gonna get you know, chalked up. And there's not much you can do about it. You can't change the groundwater unless you put in some kind of curtain drain. And well, the Minnesota Stormwater Manual does suggest you go out and do some site-specific investigation. A lot of uh, some of the regulatory organizations just adapt that conversion table saying, if this is your texture, this is your hydraulic group, and then this is the infiltration rate you can assume. And that's right in the regulatory language. So even if somebody's trying to design and do the right thing, um, Right. They, they see that in the regulations and say, oh, well, we can get by with just this. I just want to uh, make a point about sand. Uh, not all sands are created equal. And uh, when we spec a soil, we'll spec the size sand limits that we want. And you can have a sandy soil that's self-compacting that uh, is not going to be doing anybody any good. So sand uh, is not all, not all equal. Nina, yeah, there actually, there was a question too about about the compost spec. So, uh, is are those specs available online publicly? Would you be able to share links? So oh, that our audience yeah, sure. that yeah, I'm about writing a bulletin now, user friendly bulletin, but I can send it to some link. Okay, that would be great. Yeah, Minda just started up a study on compost amendments, um, and they're still taking comments on the work plan. So. I'll make sure that they have access to 
your spec, Nina. You know, I have the, the published paper and I'll take out the spec part as well. Thank you. Uh, so there's a comment from the audience. It's, it's in the q and It's I guess it's more of a comment than a question, but it, it actually does spark good discussion. Ties back into the concept of street sweeping. And you know this whole idea that, that trees uh, provide multiple benefits, but when we have an urban landscape with paved surfaces, the paved surfaces then become conduits to transport a lot of that organic material that comes out of trees, right? And so we have to think about uh, that we get a lot of benefits. We get a lot of hydrologic, we get a lot of temperature benefits, temperature mitigation, heat island effect mitigation by trees in our landscapes. And we, we can't think of them as the polluters as providing that organic content, uh, but we need to think about how do we manage the roadway surfaces and treat the runoff and capture that material. Street sweeping is a great way to manage those nutrients. Um, actually, again, tying back to the comment about the media and the sand, some of the things that I've, I've read have also shown that stormwater runoff and stormwater treatment practices like rain gardens get so much organic matter coming into them with the stormwater that really the initial compost and the initial organic matter maybe only needs to keep the rain garden alive for the first couple of years. And then all the organic matter that comes in naturally with stormwater can really sustain that nutrient balance. I don't know, Nina, have you, have you seen anything like that? Have you experienced that in your work or anybody else that we've seen here, that, that nutrient balance coming in with stormwater and all that organic material? I haven't necessarily seen that. Okay. Of course, uh, I mean, I mean go getting all the, I mean, I, I assume he's talking about street sweeping as getting the leaves off the roads. I mean, that's, those are great, you know, substrates for compost too. Right. So, I mean, I don't know where they're putting them, but they should be composted. Yeah, a lot, I think a lot of that material gets composted and reused. I mean, my personal mission, I can't stand where I see people blowing, because in, in St. Paul, they let you know, all right, the street sweepers are coming by in 10 days. Blow all your leaves in the street. All right, I'm a soil scientist. You wonder what I do with my leaves? Nothing, not a thing. I let them drop. That's what they do. I might mow them in the spring, but keep them on your property. Don't put them in the street. Yeah. Problem solved. Uh, I, I was going to make a comment in the closing section uh, that about the street sweeping. You know, there was a nice study that was done here at the university where they investigated the benefits of the street sweeping and you know, how much uh, phosphorus and other nutrients are present in the leaves. And uh, you know, it's clear that the urban environment is different than the natural environment where the leaves fall on the ground in the natural environment. They decompose, they stay where they are. Whereas in the urban environment, uh, you've got the uh, trees right along the road and so the leaves fall in the impervious area and then they run off and uh, they might go off of course as uh, large matter but then they degrade and break up because the car is driving over them and everything and those little particles have got a lot of phosphorus in them and they can end up in our, uh, in our lakes and ponds and so forth like that and uh, so it is something that needs to be taken into consideration and that this street sweeping is one practice that could help with that and I like what Matt says you know, maybe next fall, I'm not going to sweep, uh, rake the leaves off my, I mean, I, I rake the leaves and I bring them to, to the compost site, you know, but maybe I should just leave them on my lawn. It might be healthier. <laughs> Give yourself a break. Don't mow your lawn very often. Uh, three to four, three to five inch height is a good healthy height for lawn grass. When you mow it, don't bag it, just leave it. Let the soil do what it do. We have these nice sandy loams here in St. Paul. They can, they can work with you. Uh, incidentally, the, that comment on street sweeping came from uh, Paula Kalinowski, who's one of the co-authors for that street sweeping, initial street sweeping study that was done, yeah. and so, works with Gary Baker, who's the co-author <laughs> for the more recent one. So right. um, if anybody's interested in those studies and street sweeping, again, anything that we've mentioned today, if it isn't already going to be shared in the email, just send an email to me. I'd be happy to connect you with all of these resources. Uh, another couple questions actually in the chat here or in the q and I'm sorry, um, relates to the vegetation. So one question is, you know, what are some of those resources for native plants and shrubs that'll work best in Minnesota and Wisconsin? 
And then actually a parallel question to that comes again from one of our viewers from Texas. Um, are, are those gonna be rel um, relevant in Texas or where might we find uh, resources for other regions of not only North America, but beyond that? Uh, where would be a good place to kind of search for that information if you have any ideas or suggestions there? I'll let our horticulturist start. Yeah, well, um, so I have a book that would, you know, would have lots of plants, both, you know, the whole native thing has to be really thought about. I mean, I'm not a nativist. I think that if plants do well, are not invasive and are provide ecosystem services, they're valuable. If you look at the native ranges of some plants that you use, well, they may be native to North America, but they're not native to Minnesota or Texas or whatever. So um, I have plants that are both native and non-native and their question is whether they're well adapted to your site, not so much where they first you know, came aboard uh, or where they live now. Um, so I think, that, for instance, from Minnesota, I mean, a lot of the plants I use in New York would be perfectly good in Minnesota. I mean, I think I was looking at one of them, I think maybe a cephalanthus has some native range in Minnesota, a few, but everything else is, is pretty more east of that. But still, they have, you know, they're hardy, they have good value, they're fixed nitrogen, some of them, they have a lot of good values and they're not invasive. So why not use them? Um, and, you know, and they do provide pollinator support and bird support and so on. So I think we have to be a little bit broader. Also, our urban environments are nothing like what the native environment would have been uh, because of all the construction and so on that's gone on in development. So I think we should be a little bit broader about the type of plants and not get stuck with native. Um, and I have a woody plant database, which has for all of North America where the native ranges of those plants are. And, you know, just had to be honest about, well, if it's native to the Northeast, is it native to New York, is it native to Wisconsin? I mean, you know, you have to think about uh, whether it's well adapted and doing the job you want it to do. So I will happily share the booklet I have. Otherwise, I think, you know, you know, mining cooperative extension and at the university level, they might have some resources for the localities. I mean, the work I do would not be applicable for Texas, but it would still, it would be pretty well applicable for the Northern part of the Midwest. So I think, you know, we need to go not state by state, but to the ecosystem that you're in. I was, I definitely was in a mirror. Some of what Nina said is that urban environments aren't the native landscape that maybe many plant guides were designed for. So somebody like us, my first guidance would be to find a good local professionals, landscape architects and botanists who work in the area, they will know. And a company like ours, we base our future plantings based on, yeah, there's USDA plant guides, other horticultural guidelines, you know, there's the climate zones and all that. Plus we collect data from all of our previous projects and our ongoing monitoring projects. So we know what's surviving and what's not in a given area. And we incorporate climate change adaptation, which, you know, don't, don't utilize something that's currently at its, its range limits if ranges are gonna be shifting northward. So we look to the south, what do we want to be growing here in 50 years? Well, what's growing really well 50 miles south? And so you, you incorporate all the resources you can. There is no easy answer. A lot of it is trial and error. A lot of it is hiring the right experts, local experts. Yeah, I think that's a great comment. I was, I was just gonna add, we do have some resources I mentioned, or I posted the link to the Minnesota Stormwater Manual in the chat. Uh, there is a page there that hosts uh, a book that was written, Plants for Stormwater Design, and that was specifically geared towards plant selection for stormwater features. And there's a number of uh, plant species in there that are not only hardy, they can, they can uh, withstand periodic inundation and drought, which is what we often see in our stormwater systems. Um, there's even some in there for, if you're talking about northern climates, uh, chloride resistant or chloride tolerant plant species are in that list and there's more guidance on that as well. Um, thinking about natives, I've actually even heard the, the concept of bringing um, seashore type plants to places like Minnesota or New Hampshire or New York, where there are very high salt doses along roadways to see if these salt, heavily salt tolerant plants work really well in those kind of landscapes and, and salt heavy environments. So 
definitely thinking outside the box, looking for the benefits. And I do want to also echo what Matt said exactly, bringing in the landscape architects. I'm admittedly not a vegetation expert by any means. Um, I can't pronounce any of those names <laughs> that Nina mentioned. So I look to my colleagues that are landscape architects because they know not only the plants that work well, that look good, that fit the space and fit the landscape to create these urban landscapes that are beautiful and aesthetic, but also, as Matt said, they survive. You know, they have the experience with what works in these situations and in our climate. So I would, I would highly recommend our audience to look towards the landscape architects in your area, the vegetation experts in your areas, uh, and the soil experts, if you need a soil expert to help with that aspect of the project too. Get those people involved, um, get them as part and get their say on the projects uh, so that you can have success in all of the projects. Uh, anything to add to that? That was really well said. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think landscape architects can be an underutilized resource because they have a discipline that merges together botany, horticulture, agronomy, plus the human use aspect is a huge part of the architecture aspect of it. And they incorporate the, the basic idea that people need to use this space. It needs to provide a function for us both as for enjoyment and for its functional use. I, I can't say enough good things about the landscape architects I work with. That's great. Uh, we still have a, a lot of questions in the chat. I know we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. We've, we've kind of had a, our conversation has meandered along and, and I wanna shift a little bit uh, sideways from this, although it, it does relate specifically. We talked a lot about design. How do we select plants? How do we design our soils? Uh, I wanna shift the conversation towards maintenance because that's the other piece. We can't design these things with the best designs that are out there, construct them with the best known specs and contractors and construction practices that are out there and then not maintain them and hope they work for the long-term. Many stormwater control practices just can't survive without at least some level of maintenance. Uh, so the question here is related to, uh, well, the question actually comes again from Texas saying that, that the powers that be are really uh, resistant to allowing highly distributed rain gardens throughout the landscapes because the question of maintenance. What is the maintenance liability? What are the requirements? How onerous is that on the public works and the streets departments? Um, and we've, we've, entered, we've um, felt this in Minnesota as well. There's still questions about, well, what do I have to do? Uh, as a homeowner, if I'm a homeowner, homeowner in the city or the watershed district puts a rain garden in my front yard, what am I responsible for? How much work is that going to be to maintain these things? And so the question I have for the panel is, uh, what are your experiences with maintenance, both for the vegetation and maintaining the soil and the soil health and the soil structure in these type of systems, the bioswales, even the scoop and dump or a CU structural soil or tree trench system? What is the maintenance aspect? What would you recommend for our audience? And are there any resources that people can look to? Well, I'll jump in. I mean, for, for many of the, both the scoop and dump and the bioswales, we do a, a spring cleanup of any kind of dead debris, or maybe we need to reduce the height of some plants. And it's basically a one, one pass through, and then we mulch. And that is it. If we, if we have our plants close enough so they're reducing the weed pressure, we have very little weed pressure. And that's important. You don't wanna have you know, mulch that you see between plants. I mean, that's just like, come here, weed, and be a problem. Uh, so you wanna basically place your plants so that they're gonna be giving you that canopy closure. And then all you need to do is occasionally weed the edge where you're always gonna have an issue. But so it's basically one pass through with pruning, and then mulching. Maintenance will depend on what kind of pretreatment you have. Do you have a little basin to catch the grit and the gravel and the pop cans and everything else that flows in? I mean, these parking lot, I'm specifically thinking about big parking lots. Those infiltration basins get destroyed quickly. It's a big parking lot for a big facility that's not their concern. They may have some regulatory hook, like in Rice Creek, and Dave used to go get them. But a lot of these are owned by people who are forced to put them in the ground. Their desire to maintain them is limited to what they're required to do. Um, that's always going to be a fact. 
So design has to incorporate the user, which is the landowner, and give them something that they can maintain without being an expert in maintenance. Yeah, one thing we discovered at Rice Creek was that um, when we went out and did maintenance inspections, a lot of the people, a lot of the owners thought that that's what they were supposed to look like. They hated them. They didn't like them. They, they looked bad. And when they found out that they could maintain them and, and they could actually be an attractive amenity on their, their property, then they were quite happy. They would say things like, I, I didn't know we, we could do that. They just told us that we had to leave that alone because the watershed district made, made us make that. So I think uh, um, blending your feature in with, uh, with the land the land use, so if it's commercial or something, um, letting people know that they can maintain this like, like the rest of their landscaping. But understanding that if it's a side of a freeway, um, the maintenance, they're not gonna get a landscaper to go pruning at, at, uh, alongside a freeway when all they're doing with everything else is just mowing it. So it's gonna depend on um, what type of institution, if it's residential, commercial, transportation. I mean, my, my chirp on maintaining healthy soils is the same for healthy soils anywhere, including farmers. They just follow the soil health principles of continuous living roots, continuous cover, diversity of species, go with what works, but let them thrive. Um, you're obviously not going to be incorporating livestock, but that is animals are a huge component of soil health. Let there be animals. You know, that's in little ones and big ones. Yeah, that soil health part is just, it's incredible. Uh, John Gulliver had done done a study and I don't know if you're involved with it, John Niebuhr, but it was uh, showing that the, the roadside swales and ditches were actually uh, soaking in about an inch of water. And um, after he, published his results, I went out and dug holes and soil pits at his research sites. And these are essentially roadside ditches that were left alone. And the root mass and the, the, the density of, of uh, the biology in there was just incredible down to eight inches. Even if there was just hard compaction below those eight inches, I could see how that just acted like a giant sponge, a giant healthy living sponge in the soil. It was just incredible. Continuous yeah. living roots all year. I would love to see more um, shrubs incorporated into the, some of the transportation ones. I think that's, well, I think that's, that's got a, some potential. Because there's no, I mean, the whole herbaceous, you know, get a quick bang for your buck, but it's, it's a, you know, it can look awful and there can be very little in the way of uh, structure in the winter time. So I think definitely shrubs are a good way to go. Great cover. I think, it, again, it kind of echoes back to some of the previous comments, finding the right plants for the right situations, right? Ties also into maintenance. Uh, if you have a homeowner that really wants something beautiful and an amenity in their front yard, and they're willing to do the maintenance, then, then choose the plants and the, the site and the size for that, uh, for that respect. If you have a different situation where you know that maintenance is gonna be minimal, right? Maybe it's a, again, at the edge of a parking lot or, or in a situation where uh, it's just not gonna be maintained, then select the vegetation that is basically self-sustaining, right? That can, like, like what Dave said about the swales and the ditches and the native grasses, that they just kind of keep that thing running uh, on its own with very little maintenance, except for maybe the occasional mowing or, or large debris capture, right? And I do want to caveat in, in Minnesota, uh, I, I know it's not true everywhere. In Minnesota, infiltration basins, rain gardens, uh, uh, everything infiltration and filtration has to have pretreatment. So when we're talking about areas where you have a lot of soil or a lot of sediment in the runoff, that is meant to be captured in a pretreatment practice so that it does not clog up the surface of our rain gardens and our infiltration basins. So uh, I know that's not true everywhere, but, but in Minnesota, that is a requirement that we also need to keep in mind that that's part of that maintenance cycle is getting the sediment out of the pretreatment and then, and then those basins can, can function more healthily just based a lot of times on the vegetation if you can maintain the vegetation. Any other comments on maintenance or those concepts? 
Uh, I, I, would, I would just say that it seems that uh, maintenance of these practices is given kind of a secondary citizen category uh, while, you know, storm sewers, um, you know, ditches and things like that, maybe those are, you know, given first rate. And the point is, you know, if we don't maintain these facilities, these stormwater control facilities, you're going to end up having bigger storm sewers, and which is going to cost more. So I, I think uh, there was a comment on the chat about uh, the decision makers uh, have to be maybe educated about the balance between paying for this or paying for that. And you know this shouldn't be given second rate citizen uh, status just because it's a you know partly an environment uh, biological or you know a soil kind of feature. It's not a you know a bridge that somebody can put their name on or <laughs> whatever. It 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 just seems like maintenance is being deferred uh, mm -hmm. for the wrong reason, and uh, so I, I think that the decision makers need to be educated about some of this. Nina, one of the one of the um, pushbacks I got on woody vegetation, trees, and shrubs was the relation between the, the roots and potential tile lines. Have you seen any maintenance concerns with uh, the trees roots getting into the wrong places, like a drain tile pipe or something like that, or a, just a maintenance port? Uh, in a bioswale, or we're just talking about anywhere? <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> yeah, the bioswales are what I work with most, but any of those uh, three designs you showed us. Uh, well, and we don't get roots getting into uh, problems in a bioswale issue. I mean, there are lots of examples of roots getting into tiles, in, especially in Europe, but then they are, they're basically socking the, you know, uh, the tiles in a impervious, well, impervious, but a closed kind of material that prevents the roots from getting in. Um, you know, that's, it hasn't been so much of an issue as it has in maybe 20 years ago where there was a lot of issue roots getting into, in, into drain lines, but uh, uh, not so much recently. So, I mean, I know where they have done it. They've actually, you know, when they have new, new tiles being put in, they will actually put a sock around it so to prevent some, and to prevent the joints, the joints where the roots get in. So to have it more, more uh, smooth, unjointed, tiles. So that's the, the other issue. Sorry, I can't give you more on that. No, oh, thanks. That was, that was helpful. I do know in Minnesota, there is, there is some fear uh, among designers about putting socks and, and wrap around under drains because that, be, you know, the, the fear is that can become the layer that becomes clogged mm -hmm. and then it's buried. And so it's unmaintainable without literally digging up the entire practice to fix it or replace it. Um, and I, honestly, I've seen research both. I've seen case studies where, it, where that happens. I've seen case studies where it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, but I know there is a real fear among designers and installers, even in Minnesota, that if we put a sock around our under drain, it's going to fail. It's going to clog that's up a, and I can't fix a, it. That's a legitimate concern. I've definitely seen it for our projects. Um, well, we are getting very close to our time here. I think what I'll do is I'll wrap up the panel discussion. Again, we have many, many really good questions, really good comments coming in in the chat. Again, we will share all of these with the panelists. They will all have an opportunity to provide answers, links to resources. We will share as much information as we can. I really appreciate our audience for being so engaged today with this. Uh, I will now ask kind of the last question, the wrap up question for our panelists. And it is really asking, what are the key takeaways that each of you would give our audience today based on this discussion to help all of us as an industry uh, improve not only water resources, but ecosystem health and the quality of life from all of this? What would you say? And I will do it in the same order that I introduced everybody. So we'll start with Professor John Niebuhr. Yes, uh, thanks everybody on the panel and all the questions from the audience. And I just want to you know, simply say, listen to your soil scientist, your plant scientist, and your landscape architect. Um, that was something I wrote down quite a while ago during the, in the beginning of the presentation, but I was glad to hear it mentioned by Andy 
and I, I think Matt was talking about it as well. So another thing is that uh, we need to do something about all this uh, plant residue that's ending up on our impervious areas. So this street sweeping idea or something like it, I think needs to have some uh, attention paid to it. I do want to mention there's going to be a, a session at the Soil Science Society of America meeting in Salt Lake City. If whether it's in person or not is still questionable, but that'll be in November and it's on urban soils. So it's going to look into a lot of the things related to how urban soils, uh, what happens to soils in the urban environment. And uh, so I, I had a couple other comments about designing systems for hydrology and then also about the impact of stormwater practices near pavement, because there was a question about that, but I don't think we have time to go into those now. That's great, John, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're running very short on time here. So, uh, so then Dave, what would be your key takeaways from our discussion today? I think there's more potential in, in Minnesota to use, uh, get loam back into the mixes, the soil mixes. Um, Nina was showing that that was working pretty good. I think the challenge will be defining that loam and making sure it's something that can be used in a rain garden. Also, I'd like to see more uh, woody vegetation incorporated into some of these stormwater basins and find a way to be able to do that. And then the maintenance question, convincing people that, uh, you know, being realistic about the maintenance costs and planning for it and treating it as an amenity you have rather than uh, the mature. These are assets, right? They're assets in our in our landscapes that, that we get a lot of benefits from. And so we need to maintain them to keep them working. Uh, Matt, what would be your key takeaways from our discussion today? Because a couple of things, we talked about education, but you know, this falls in the engineering world, but there's not necessarily the necessary overlap with the sort of natural sciences world. I was just looking at our licensing board numbers this morning. Uh, we have 13,882 licensed professional engineers in Minnesota. We have 411 landscape architects. We have 43 professional soil scientists. David and I are 4.6% of our state's soil scientists. We couldn't even be together in the same room if this was live out of security concerns. <laughs> um, my other takeaway, uh, a little more serious, is I didn't get a chance to get into my project description, but a takeaway I have in this is to, for other professionals, think about environmental justice. So we put a lot of lands, a lot of projects in the ground. They have to get paid by someone somewhere. A lot of our really cool projects might be for a watershed district. And if you're not from Minnesota and aren't familiar with the watershed district concept, it's a, a legal governing district that as close as possible mirrors the catchment area of a given body of water. They overlap counties, cities, everywhere else. They get their funding uh, by the local property tax levy. So we have one watershed district that just by their good fortune, their creek, which was never buried underground, goes through a large, very affluent area, part of Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, the West Metro, Lake Minnetonka. They have a massive funding base so for example, they put some projects in the ground that required them to buy five, six, seven houses, buy a city block and take that out. They can do that because they have fantastic resources, but for whatever the way these things work, their, their funding comes from where they are. So if you live in an affluent area, you get affluent projects. If you don't, you don't. So particularly for higher level policymakers, people that are in position to do something about that, a, it applies to school districts as well. That gets into a much larger subject, but we have the money. We don't spread it equally. And we don't think about spreading it equally. I know funding, funding is a big topic and that's, that's coming from our audience that, that we need more discussions on funding and how to do that in areas where you don't have that kind of a tax base or funding source. So and we need to be more creative Minnesota with funding has, sources. In Minnesota has a pretty extraordinary level of, of natural resource and environmental funding grants and loans, and everything else, we take it for granted and we still have to do better here. I, I still meet people that are amazed to hear that the state of Minnesota passed a statewide tax increase to pay for water quality. So uh, that's still amazing and, and very rare, I would say. That fund rains money, I love yeah. it. 
So Nina, you get the last word on our discussion today. What are your key takeaways for our audience? Well, it's all soil and plants for me. Um, soil systems, designing them correctly. I mean, you can have the greatest plants in the world. If you have lousy soil, you're gonna have lousy plants. So it's dealing with soil, both in terms of what it's meant to do in terms of infiltration or whatever else ecosystems that you want it to do. And then to, to use plants that are gonna be adaptable and diverse and provide all the ecosystem benefits which we expect them to do. And uh, think about, you know, is this plant gonna create a lot of maintenance for you? I mean, you know, I love raspberries, but we just can't have those raspberry steps on the, on the school campus because uh, there'll be a problem. Not, not to be bad about you, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's thinking about the maintenance, but again, there has to be some maintenance, but making sure you have a, you know, a season where you know you're going to do this and you, you know, do what you can and then say you can let it go for quite a while. Those are great comments. Well, I want to thank the panel and our guest speaker, Nina, for setting us, setting the stage on this topic.